Today on the Clean Power Hour, community solar is growing in Pennsylvania, maybe. America's highways are a significant opportunity for solar PV. The Vikings are coming for your hydro and floating solar opportunity. Tax revenue from community and utility scale solar is helping rural communities. It's day 10 of the Solar 500 Challenge. Give us a thumbs up and please subscribe to the channel. Welcome to the Clean Power Hour. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. Welcome to the show, John Weaver, commercial solar guy and co-host. Timothy, how do you do today? How are you? I'm doing okay. It's a beautiful fall day, a little nippy here, but um, say la vie, as we say, and I'm just, I'm just pumped for the clean energy transition, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some aspects of the clean energy transition. I'm going to highlight Tony Siva's book a little later on in the show, but um, before we get into the news, John, do you still love Tesla? <laughs> uh, I'm still very happy with this neat little car and I'm still learning things. I took a, a road trip this weekend, a longer one. Um, let's see, about a five-hour drive from New Bedford, Massachusetts, up past Albany towards Syracuse. I uh, had a few uh, char supercharger experiences and learned a little bit about when you do things and how to better do them in the car. Driving is getting better. I've let the car do a few more things on the highway on its own. Um, <clears throat> so it's... Uh, you know, I am progressing in my knowledge of the thing that I have, of the tool that I have to use. And, uh, and it's kind of neat. And of course, I took my brother's uh, kids in it. There's four of them. They're all young kids. And the car has a fart game. And we made fart noises. And they laughed loudly. So there's that. <laughs> fart mode, as I call it. <laughs> called the missions it's called the missions you know of course it's the, the app it's it's an emissions app and you direct the emissions yeah tesla makes the sounds so, so it's still a lot of sense of humor um you know you you saw the whole 69 420 joke going around yes he, and and he just he tweeted i'm a child because i'm a child Yep. Uh, he lowered the price of the Model S for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about to 69,420 to compete with Lucid Motors and to make a joke. But well, hey, we've got a lot of good news today about the solar, solar and storage, community solar. I wanted to start with your uh, blog and I'm going to share my screen. You have written a wonderful story here about community solar in Pennsylvania. Let's get into it. What's the story, John? So, you know, first off, that image you see on the screen there, that's a project of ours that we're developing. That's about six and a half megawatts, about 25, 26 acres, the solar portion. The green is um, we have a special permit based on uh, setbacks, water restrictions, environmental. And so that's our actual project we're designing. And uh, it's in Pennsylvania, Wolf's Town, uh, uh, Wolf Township. And <clears throat> what the article, though, focuses more so on Pennsylvania and hypothetical community solar legislation. Well, legislation that's been submitted but not signed. So it's hypothetical community solar opportunities. Um, UPenn Ag School wrote a white paper looking at about a gig of solar that's in the queues, mostly community solar they chose to look at, not the big projects. And this gig, they said, listen, if we built this gig of solar for community solar uh, under the legislation's uh, logic, what's it going to do for the state? And what they found is that this gig would pay anywhere from 700 to a thousand bucks an acre for landowners. And that's why I wanted to focus because I'm a solar developer and I want to help landowners get projects built because that's what I want to build. And so landowners in Pennsylvania could earn up to $4.2 million for leasing about 4,100 acres to build this gig of solar power, this one gigawatt. And that chart, that top chart you see there, that's a breakdown on a county level 
of the projects that are in the queue. So, you know, there's, there's uh, again, it's just over one gigawatt of solar power in the queue, like 225 projects, and they're in each county in this various, uh, in these queues. And so they found that there would be $1.8 billion of economic activity from th this solar volume. It earned $4.2 million of lease payments a year. It create, you know, 11,000 uh, jobs, 5,600 that were direct jobs. And again, 4.2 million bucks per year for 20 to 30 years for these landowners. And that's sort of kind of passive income coming off their land because they don't have to manage this land. This will be, uh, from, from the landowner's perspective, third party managed. And I thought it was just important to talk about how landowners get into it, uh, the opportunities that are there, because, you know, again, we're working a project right now. Um, Jason Klein, he's our landman located in New York, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and he's got a project, 25 acres, 6.5 megs uh, that we're moving through the development process. And, you know, that's 25 grand a year of just a payment for his land and no, no work necessary, no risk from the farming, nothing. And so it's uh, community solar is coming in many places. The market seems to like it. It satiates a few needs and it gets the locals into it because you got these small projects dotted everywhere, it seems. And um, I always like it when some random private person now has a solar power farm, not just a rooftop system, but a farm in their backyard because that's cool. So so Pennsylvania, if this legislation passes, man, there's going to be a lot of people who are making a decent chunk of change hosting a solar power plant. So it's, it seems like Pennsylvania is perhaps where Illinois was in 2017. I mean, we got our legislation signed in, the, in December of 2016. It went into force in June of 2017. And then it was full game on. But the developers had been in the state for a couple of years the big ones like Cypress Creek and uh, they were running around looking for land leases. Uh, they're called option agreements near substations because you want your community solar farm to be near infrastructure so you can interconnect to the grid and it not cost an arm and a leg. Right. Yep. <clears throat> we ended up with 800 projects that got through initial permitting and interconnection, which is what was necessary in order to apply into the REC program here in Illinois. But there were only RECs for 111. So, which is, which is okay. It's, a, it's an okay start. We now have, you know, uh, 222 megawatts AC, uh, say 300 megawatts DC of community solar that's getting built and we're building uh, four of them this fall. <clears throat> and it is such a win-win for the farmers, John, because what, what we don't realize in America is how the economics of cash cropping work. Cash croppers in, in central Illinois, it's corn and beans, okay? We have some of the best prime farm ground in the country and in the world. If you're renting your land to a, a farmer, you're getting $300 an acre, okay, for, for a farmer to grow corn or beans. And then the solar farmers come along and they say, well, Mr. Landowner, I'll give you $900 an acre, right? So they're tripling their income and it's, it's more guaranteed than the income from farming because of some of the nuances of, well, if you have a bad year, then you have to share that pain with the renter and so forth. So it's a huge win. And it's actually going to help landowners keep their land and keep ne the next generation interested in owning the land. That's another problem for farming communities, right? Is that the next generation wants to go to the city and uh, become a tech worker um, because these rural towns are just really struggling to keep the lifeblood, keep the action, keep the entrepreneurship and keep a vibrant economy. So the 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 work so a, a field laying fallow for 25 years underneath solar panels with the way you guys drop the piles in 
That's got to be a net benefit for the land. You know, even if we're not going to graze it and start planting strategic pollinators, I'm just talking just straight leaving the land. Uh, you know, that land, the nitrogen should get a little stronger, you know, maybe, you know, not having good cover on it or just normal basic grasses might not make it too much better, but, you know, just, but after 25 years, is this a net positive for the land? Yeah, you know, in farming, they call this letting the land rest, right? It used to be a big thing before we had industrial pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. And now, of course, we just keep farming it and, and we're pushing harder and harder and harder on the soil. And it's actually, when you, when you turn your, your corn and bean field into a solar farm, it's, it's a huge sigh of relief for the land and the microorganisms. And the, yes, the land is going to get more uh, fertile and much more biodiverse just naturally. You'll be mowing it. You got to mow it to keep the weeds down because uh, otherwise everybody will freak out and start picketing your solar farm. Um, farmers are very sensitive to weeds and we have weeds that are taller than me. Literally the weeds here get seven feet tall, but <laughs> And, and, and then I'm certain that if we, uh, for instance, if we do a, um, a pollinator friendly, that is sheep grazing friendly, we have a, a great, um, a great ability to better the land, or at least keep it solidly getting it, you know, I mean, I, I know you don't want too much sheep fertilizer on that grass, but you know, over 25 years, spreading it out, managing it appropriately. I bet you could really create some value there. And, and I was reading about um, uh, Ernst Seeds and their work in the East Coast. They just signed a big 70 megawatt uh, project where they have their fuzz and buzz um, uh, seed mix. The fuzz is that it's sheep friendly. The buzz is that it's pollinator friendly. And they've been working on this uh, seed mix for a while. And so they just deployed it at a 70 megawatt power plant. I think it's for, uh, it's either University of Pennsylvania or Penn State and big project in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, so it's just good to listen. And, you know, whenever you, we talk farming, I'm just trying to imagine the next generation, the agrovoltaics, agriculture plus photovoltaics, a combination of the two in the fields. You know, this early stage with sheep, and with these uh, bugs and everything, the uh, pollinator friendly, that's first stage, but we're going to do a lot more. Uh, Blue Wave is doing community solar in mass, and they're going to be doing vegetables plus solar that I'm reading about. So I'm looking forward to seeing that launch and seeing the press on it. So interesting. Farming is good. So I want to go to a story uh, because... My sons are Vikings. My sons are both dual citizens of Norway. And what you're looking at here is Skatech Solar's website. They have one of the most beautiful websites. They're an international solar developer based in Oslo, Norway. And they work a lot in the Middle East and Africa and Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, they don't work in North America yet. Um, not sure why, but, um, but anyway, there's a story about Scottech right in the news and I got to find that story now. Um, here we go. Scottech solar to acquire hydropower developer touts floating solar potential. So they bought this company. Um, what is it? SN power? What's the story, John? Well, you know, it's funny. It's Scott Tech, I like how you say it. I've, I've always called it Skatic, but uh, they're, you know, a big time developer, global developer. And for some reason, I thought they did a project in Washington state, but maybe they, had, they didn't. Um, and now they bought a hydro company. And specifically, they said for the purpose of connecting their solar plants on top of it. And also probably to tap into a new energy thing and be a different type of clean energy company. But, uh, you know, last week we spoke about how a uh, floating solar was hitting price parity with ground-based solar and that it was scaling and, 
and all kinds of neat stuff and then can meet 40% at the very, very high end, 40% of global electricity usage. Well, these guys, these folks, they took that to heart. And, you know, so they're solar people. They do floating solar. Great. Now they own hydro. Cool. What they, what I really like is that they're a solar developer who now has probably one of the best uh, business development uh, call lists to really in the solar floating industry. Like now they have actual hydro people, hydro engineers in-house who can sit down and talk in-house with their own solar engineers and tie everybody together. And I bet you these people know the designs and the engineering and the nuances better than anybody as well. They know the competition. And these are the type of people that know the names of ed- every hydroelectric plant within, you know, 50 miles, you know, energy nerds. Like I can tell you where all the big solar plants are around us because I drive by them and look at them and people ask me, I'm like, well, the one that's on this street and this street, and they laugh at me because I know exactly what it looks like. Well, the people that work for this hydro company, they probably have a great LinkedIn connection list of everybody that owns a hydro plant across, across the planet. And I'm, sco- I'm sure that this company said, okay, business development wise, how are we going to make money off this deal? How do we make um, three out of two? And the three is from combining the sales team. Well, I hypothesize that the three is from combining these two sales teams and they're going to accelerate the business development efficiency and just knock some home runs and start dropping some, some volume. Uh, PV Tech reported that we, are, we should see 10 gigs of floating solar by 2025. And I think we just went from like, nearly nothing two, three years ago to about a gig or two right now. And we'll go from a gig or two to 10 in the next four, four years. So, so good growth. I mean, still a small piece of the overall, but maybe, you know, 2025, we'll probably install close to 200 gigs of solar. This will be 5% of the capacity. That's not bad. That's something extra 5% doesn't hurt. 200 gigs by 2025, you think? Global? Yeah. Global. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we covered that uh, story last week. So check out last week's edition, too, for more about these hydro plants. You know, they've got a reservoir behind the dam, and it's just sitting there, just like your rooftop is sitting there, right? Day in, day out. Why not use it for a solar array and make some extra power from it? So... And I wonder if uh, uh, any, how many of these sites could do pumped hydro, because I always hear, you know, if solar is producing excess at high noon and there's an opportunity for pumped hydro, I always hear that the cheapest energy storage is pumped hydro, like tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour, hundredths of a cent, like super, super cheap. And, you know, 5% of sites have a pumped hydro opportunity. That ain't bad. That's not bad at all. So I wonder how that might work out. Yeah, I don't know. I've I've done just a little bit of homework on pumped hydro, um, and I don't know if the average uh, hydro dam is is a candidate. That is the challenge of with, with pumped hydro is you have to have a reservoir, um, and well, these people know because they just hired they just bought a hydro company, and internally. <laughs> They know. I mean, there's probably a dude who has a spreadsheet and said, yes, these 422 plants in Europe all have pumped hydro opportunity from this white paper that I did as a college university specialist because they just bought smart people. That's 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 the biggest coup that I see going on there. So good job, Skadik. Yeah. Yeah, I say Skatek just because that's how the Norwegians pronounce it, but I don't know how we say it in English. Sk- sk- you would think Scandinavia, sk- Skatek or Skatek. I don't know. But, I like um, that one. So if you know the proper pronunciation, that's the one I'm going with. So Skatek. That's it. I'm done. Yeah. Um, and there it SN, is. SN Power, uh, that's the only other language I speak is Norwegian. Um, which is which is a fun language to speak, and it was pretty easy to learn, uh, a lot easier than German. SN Power is a Norwegian company too, and, and you know Norway gets eighty percent plus of their power from hydro. They have huge hydro resources. Um, it's a, it's a land of mountains and rivers and lakes, 
uh, like no other. So um, they're, they're very analogous to um, some of our, what is it, Maine maybe? Maine, Maine gets a lot of hydropower, doesn't it? Maine definitely does. Uh, Vermont does. New Hampshire yeah. does. You know, all those, all those states up there. We get some of it down here. Upstate New York does. That's something I uh, got a firsthand education on on my driving trip this weekend. Upstate New York is very clean electricity, a lot of hydro. Yeah, hydro is is good, although it has some ecological issues. Of course, it's hard for fish to migrate through those uh, through that built environment. So it 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 does have a double edge. And frankly, what's going on in hydro right now is that a lot of dams are getting decommissioned. Um, but anyway, we digress. Yep, let's always. talk about let's talk about the highway opportunity for solar PV. Uh, this is something I've thought many times about, and I know that there's some some studies done in California. This is a study done by what U UT Austin, is that right? Yeah, UT yep, Austin. Yep. And it just makes sense, right? When you're driving down the highway, there are these right of ways. And you're close to infrastructure, you're close to cell towers, you're close to power lines. And so we should, we should definitely drill down more on solarizing along the land along highways. Was this looking more at the right of ways or just at land accessible to the highway? Oh, right away. We're really looking at the right of way stuff uh, connected to the highways. Just, you know, a lot of places have big chunks in the middle and then on the north side facing south. I looked at a few uh, chunks of highway. I think it looks specifically at one chunk that's in Georgia, another that's in Oregon. And they went through and just kind of analyzed, you know, per distance, how many megawatts they could fit. And, and they just found massive amounts of underutilized space. Uh, you know, sure. again... Just like a rooftop, just like floating on water, we got that space again here. Shout out to Tim Sylvia at PV Magazine for writing this article. And this is a wonderful chart. Texas, Illinois, California, Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, North Carolina, New York, Tennessee, Missouri, Indiana. Uh, huge amounts of, of uh, solar potential. This is gigawatt hours per year. So many states with over 1,500 gigawatt hours of potential. Um, <clears throat> yep. And, and, and what I like. With the, we have to I remember. With the highway thing. Go ahead. <laughs> with the highway thing, we have a great opportunity to run power lines, HVDC, along this publicly owned infrastructure. Um, if we're going to if we take the time to put a whole bunch of solar here, you know, we've already got wires there for the lights, but we really just ought to consider dropping in some HVDC running underneath our highways, you know, 10, 20 feet under as much as we can and just boom, big power line. It's public. The highway already connects to the biggest power users across the nation, very logically laid out and it connects to biggest cities and, you know, where people are. And if we string those cities together in an electricity network via the highway system, we will have our HVDC network and we won't use up any additional land. We'll just right at the edge of the highway, we'll have ourselves a new interchange. We'll start building some new infrastructure near the highway so we can get the electricity out, convert it from DC to AC and pump it into the local grids. And so I, you know, cool. Solar around the highway, awesome. Another great place to put it. I'm totally going to support it even more so if this gives us a Trojan horse into getting HVDC coincided with the highway network. Yeah, I'm a big fan of HVDC. I, I think it's curious that the United States is so slow to embrace that technology. It's so much more efficient. I don't know what the Delta is off the top of my head, but high voltage DC is clearly something that the Chinese are going hard after and super high voltage AC as well. It's a both end, I think. <laughs> And Texas showed us a path. Texas built a, a high voltage AC network uh, surrounding its, you know, 90% of the electricity in Texas moves through this 
HVAC network, and that has allowed cheap wind to circle the state. And, uh, and it's about to allow cheap solar to do the same. So, I mean, we have a path. We have some in-nation experiments with the benefits that a, a highly interconnected electrical power grid can gain. So, so I, I, I like this idea for the solar. I just, I really like it if we can shoehorn some power lines in there. I want to highlight the energy transition show, John, they, their most recent episode, this is a podcast of Chris Nelder's at, um, <clears throat> what is the name of the Institute? Rocky Mountain Institute, right? And uh, Chris is cranking it out. Here he is with episode 132, dedicated to an overview of what's going on with solar, past, present, future. He interviews, um, I don't know her name, but she's with, Bloomberg New Energy, <clears throat> BNEF. <clears throat> is it Jenny uh, so Chase just, by any chance? Sorry? Is it Jenny Chase by any chance? I think that's it. I, yeah. I couldn't find it. He didn't put the name in the show notes, which I thought was odd, but um, maybe it's further down. I, you, have to, uh, you have to subscribe to get the full podcast. He, he does these like 20 minute introductions for free. But anyway, Check out the energy transition show. Nelder's cranking it out and it's great content. I don't want to dwell too much on that, but um, I do want to go to that story that you brought us, John, about Meyer Burger. Yeah. Who is Meyer Burger and why should we care? Come on. You should know this. I know you know this. I'm just <laughs> messing with you. So uh, some, uh, I love the concept of, uh, not making the machine, but making the machine that makes the machines. Because Meyer Burger is the company that makes the machines that make solar panels. Um, they are a cutting edge inventor of solar manufacturing equipment. They're the ones that moved solar, uh, uh, solar silicon uh, ingots being cut from slurry wires, which is just literally just a straight up wire cutting solar uh, silicon into solar cells. And then they made it a diamond wire and that took over the whole industry. And they literally made a wire that was thinner, sharper, better to waste less silicon. And, and they're also the ones that make the machines that make uh, heterojunction solar cells. The REC Alpha that's a heterojunction solar panel made by REC Group, manufactured in Singapore. It's a, um, it's a heterojunction solar panel. So that means it's two layers, two junctions, grabbing uh, different electricity from different side chunks of the panel because there's multiple layers producing electricity at different voltages. So you have two junctions that are tuned a little bit differently that grab electricity from the solar cell from slightly different photons that are a little, have less different energy. And they're making these machines. And Hedero and Meyer Berger, this, this year, they said, listen, we're tired of just making the machines and barely getting along while solar panel manufacturers are doing acceptably globally. We now are going to make machines and make our own panels. And this is not trivial. This is part of a European push. Uh, an EU wide to get 10, 20 gigs of solar panel manufacturing on the continent. And they specifically want to compete with China. They believe that their technological advance, uh, advancing um, the fact that they're inventing the technology will let them continue to stay a step ahead because people in all around the world are buying Meyer Berger's technology to be number one. Well, Meyer Berger will be number one before these people will be. And so the machine maker is becoming the machine seller. And that's really, really interesting. They're going to make some great heterojunction modules. Their pricing might be a little stronger. Well, let me rephrase it. Their pricing will be stronger than Chinese product. However, technology wise, it could be a generation ahead, half a generation ahead. Another sales pitch of theirs is that it's going to be very clean electricity because right now European electricity is a little cleaner than 
Chinese electricity. So the goal is to build up an ecosystem of solar panel manufacturing. Meyer Berger is going to be one of the leaders. And, and it's just sweet. If you play that video, you can just see them working on uh, Meyer Berger machines. And, you know, people making machines don't really share that too much because, you know, smart people look at it and take tips and tricks. But it's just neat. It's just neat to see the inside of a warehouse sometimes. And so when I stared at that video, I'll be honest, I, I did a little bit of a Yelp when I saw it. I was like, oh, look at this. Look at this video. This is Meyer Burger stuff. Machines making machines. It's sweet. I like it. So Meyer Burger's cool. We should follow them. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, I know the name Meyer Burger, but I, I didn't realize just how influential they are in the industry as a whole. I think it is intriguing that they're getting into panel manufacturing. Uh, that seems like a very cutthroat business. Um, but she making business is just as cutthroat. Manufacturing technology moves from west to east just as quickly as panel manufacturing did. So now these guys are thinking, hey, we've gotten to a point where we can commoditize this product. And yeah, we'll be cutthroat, but we'll be good enough. Just like VW makes a high quality premium product that's that's this pitch that's part of this pitch i think so yeah it's cutthroat but when all the machine makers when all the panel makers are buying from meyer burger well maybe maybe they can find an extra penny or two and and cut and cover some bills because they to be blunt they were getting their butt kicked uh just making machines barely making money uh and and their stock price showed it and everybody was like "Ooh, are you guys going to be in existence and so this is a uh, this is something they have to do in order to sustain who they are. To be blunt, you know they they need to do this and be successful at it. Otherwise, they won't be making solar hardware for too much longer. Cool. Well, we've got a bunch of stories in the queue. Uh, dealer's choice. What do you want to talk about next? I will go there. Um, well, I mean, I guess. For me, I wanted to talk about Violet Solar Next, who's uh, they're they're coming out with a new panel. They're a U.S. manufacturer, number seven on our list. Okay. And I want to talk about a couple of items that they talked about in their article um, because I like their pitch. Uh, Meyer Berger that we just spoke about, they're aiming for being a super efficiency, a super premium product made by the best engineers. Violet, their pitch is a 50-year product warranty. Next year, next summer, you're going to be able to buy a 50-year warranty on a solar panel. How's that for you, Tim? I love it. The, the article talks about the encapsulation of solar panels back in the day being strong enough to have panels running nearly the same output as they were back then, 30, 40 years later, running at 99%. And this fully comes down to the sealing of the environment, how well we sealed that material in the solar panel. Well, this group says, listen, it's not lost science. It's just that everyone else was cutting costs and 50 years wasn't worth it. But nowadays, maybe it is. And so maybe they'll spend a little more money on a capsulant and have a 50 year warranty on their product. And so that's, I, and they're based in, they're going to be based in Washington state, Charlie Gay. Charlie Gay is one of the smartest people in the solar industry. He worked, I think for the department of energy and worked for NREL and he just knows a lot. Like he's been in the solar industry and he's like, you know, they say people have been around the block. Well, Charlie, I think built the block. He was part of those people. <laughs> and, uh, and so now he's going to head a new solar panel manufacturer and they're going to be making silicon in Washington state from an old silicon factory that shut down. They're building a facility across the street. So some dude, some lady is going to walk across the street to buy some silicon and bring it back on a truck. And I think that's kind of cool just to think about the concept. So, so it's a, yeah. it's a full life cycle manufacturing facility. They're going to make the, solar cells and the panels yes yes they'll uh yeah. so they'll be they'll be buying the silicon ingots from across the street and then they'll be well they might even just be buying ross uh, i'm not sure exactly what rec is going to deliver whether it'll be ingots or wafers but 
what's coming out of the uh, violet plant will be panels, final panels. So they'll have a full structure in there, wafers, uh, cells, and then module assembly. Wow. Because, you know, I mean, the thing that happened in, in solar, right, is there were some homegrown American panel manufacturers like SunPower and slowly but surely all of that has gone overseas. Now we, now we see some reshoring of the panel manufacturing, not the cell manufacturing for the most part, right? The cells are still for the most part made in China or in Asia. And then some of those companies like JA Solar is doing panel assembly in the U S so Violet is going to be making a true blue American product, huh? Yeah, I'm that's. Skeptical. I mean, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, they are going to be making a 100% made in, I mean, made in Washington product. I mean, Washington State. It's not even going to cross the street to finalize the product. I wonder where they'll get their aluminum. We have a lot of cheap aluminum in the U.S., I think. Um, the plastics that go into the unit, I wonder where, where that product will come from. That'd be some interesting research. They do very specifically talk about the CO2 content of their product because if, if their silicon is made in Washington state, Washington state's electricity is very hydro centric and hydro, of course, very low CO2. So they will have cheap electricity because Washington state electricity is cheap and they will have clean electricity and they've already started to talk this up. And the majority of the electricity usage that goes into a solar panel, the manufacturing is the production of the silicon to move it from raw product to highly refined uh, polysilicon, where you then choose whether it's going to be a, a multi or a mono product. And this, of course, is going to be a mono product. So there's a high level of more of uh, refinement going from the polysilicon feedstock to turn it into the monosilicon final product. So there's that mon that poly to mono conversion is just expensive from an electricity, a KWH standpoint. And it's one of the bigger chunky costs that go into making these solar cells. And so if they get it cheaper and if they get it cleaner, we have a, a, another neat thing to talk about, low CO2 solar panels. And it's there was a recent organization, and maybe we should talk about it next week, but a recent organization cropped up talking about solar panels that are 50% lower with their CO2 needs during manufacturing than standard. And if that occurs, the energy, the emission payback for a solar panel will be under a year, almost everywhere on earth. Um, because, you know, payback is anywhere from half a year to two years, maybe three years these days. Well, you chop it in half one more time, you know, almost everybody's getting close to a year and I bet you 75% of projects will pay back fast. And that's, you know, that's the long game. That's what we really care about is lowering CO2 and Violet. Um, there, they might be a, a neat little trend, longer panels with, with a uh, lower CO2 in manufacturing. So that, so I mean, even there's another double, another in increase. So if you have a panel that uses a hundred grams of CO2, to get 25 years of life. Well, that's, you know, a hundred per life. But now if you double that panel's life to 50 years, well, you effectively have cut the CO2 in half. Well, that's cool. And then if you cut the CO2 in half in the beginning, now you've like quadrupled your panel CO2, your panel emissions efficiency. And so that's being talked about now. And that's pretty cool. Uh, so I, I like this violet thing. It caught my attention for a few, a few reasons, 50 year warranty. Of course, the first, uh, high quality people, uh, Washington state based low CO2, just some neat stuff going on there. I really like it. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I love that 50 year warranty. We also need to make solar panels more recyclable, uh, because we are going to have, Soon billions and then trillions of used solar panels on our hands. And we uh, today they're very difficult to recycle or repurpose. Um, I think the state of the art is 
grinding them up and uh, separating them into their constituent materials. And it's just very energy intensive um, and potentially dangerous for those people <clears throat> involved in the process. But, um, well, hey, let's, let's turn to that story about Fluence. <clears throat> Fluence acquires grid software startup AMS. Pioneering California battery startup AMS finds an exit and a home for its market bidding software with the global energy storage supplier. I'm not familiar with AMS, but I understand that they were a battery manufacturer who then <clears throat> pivoted into being a software manufacturer because they made a software that was very good. And of course, the virtual power plant is, is truly a software driven phenomenon, but what, it, what, what do you like about this story? Oh, it's Julian Spector. Thank you, Julian. Oh, of course it's Julian Spector. So we always like Julian's writing. Uh, well, I just, you know, this makes sense. Um, you know, Fluence has a huge pipeline of energy storage projects. AMS has the technical capability to tie together these projects and make a giant distributed power plant. AMS has, AMS had been winning bids in Southern California for years, uh, doing this VPP thing, virtual power plant. And, and they've done real great work. They signed maybe some of the first ones I saw of power purchase agreements for 10 years with batteries. And the purpose of the battery was to manage demand charges and other items and to just lower electricity on site. And they were able to, to make it work. And they won big contracts with big volume in Southern California Edison territory. And so that's how I learned about a, about them. And, you know, you just, you need the brains to make this big hulk of a, of a pile of metal to be smart. And AMS wrote the code of that brain. And, you know, on a slight level, I'm slightly surprised that Fluence didn't have that type of talent in-house because Fluence is a combination of two giant companies, AES and Siemens. And these folks have all the resources, but maybe I guess you go with somebody who's got a great portfolio, who's already profitable, who's already doing it. Um, it it's a real smart move for Fluence because Fluence is looking to go public soon. Um, they want to raise a bunch of cash for growth. And they spoke about needing to raise somewhere like, I don't know, two to $5 billion. Um, maybe it was 500 million. Yeah, a few hundred million among friends. And uh, so Fluence wants to grow and do more and they will. They're smart. They, they've got a, they're a leader in this space of distributed energy storage. And this is just going to make them smarter. Um, you know, their hardware will be smarter. Just like you speak Norwegian. And now there's a whole bunch of people you can hang out with and be cool. AMS lets batteries hang out with every single utility and be cool probably. And, uh, and that's, that's awesome. I mean, I, I probably don't even comprehend what it really means because, uh, we're talking major topology, major power grid intelligence going on here. And uh, I like energy storage as grid assets. I'm looking forward to seeing our energy storage based power grid. Um, it's it's going to be cool. Solid state power grid with batteries everywhere, just sucking in generation from who cares. These batteries won't care where the electricity comes from. They just want some juice and they'll feed it as is fit and in the exact amount that is necessary to give to the power grid. So I think it's cool. Yep. Storage is the future. Storage is the holy grail. Here's a story about tax revenue from solar projects. One of the reasons solar is so popular here, they're highlighting North Carolina. Um, and this is an amazing graph. John, what's the what's the story here? I have I have some thoughts on this as well, but uh, what's the story? Well, you know, when you build a solar power project, it generates revenue. Uh, it's got to have some police protection. It's got to have some fire protection. It's got to have some local infrastructure to manage it. And these locals, they know how much money it's going to make. They know what the labor is going to be. And we come to agreements. We go out to the folks. We present. We ask the town uh, if we can pay a certain amount because it helps our, our budgets. And they get a check from us. Just like the land lease people in Pennsylvania we started off the show talking about, 
This is another half. Of, this is another piece of the coin. You know, solar development, you know, we bring significant financial benefit to all of our customers, whether it's a rooftop customer I build for or whether you, Tim, build in one of your giant, you know, three to five megawatt power plants, man. Those things are cool. And, and you know, there's money flowing for the people that build it, for the landowners, for the developer that owns it, for the, for the developer that brings it together, for the asset owner, and for the local town. There's just, you know, everybody gets a little piece of the pie. And, you know, if you're going to give up some land and you're going to pay for the school because of this land, uh, because of this solar, it's got to have a fair trade off. And this is that trade. This is what we do. We bring different types of revenue to different markets, just like the wind turbine people have been feeding the Midwest for 15, 20 years in an amazing way. Solar people are just feeding these uh, these farm areas just as well. Anybody that's, that has land, their local jurisdiction is going to like the solar because we're not going to add new traffic. There's not going to be any cars to manage. There's going to be uh, one electrician going out once a quarter, twice a quarter, hopefully, if we don't mess things up, and checking out, tightening some screws. You're not going to notice anything. Maybe maybe you have to have the cops drive down that road one extra time a month to keep the kids from messing around in the field. But uh, it's 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 just it's bringing revenue. It's just bringing revenue to places where there wasn't, and it's dispersing that revenue. You know, uh, distributed energy means distributed financial opportunity, and each farmer has a chance. You know, if you just have, you know, you, you have one power plant that's four gigawatts. Well, cool. The people that have that four gigawatt plant, they're going to get a lot of money for selling that land. But nobody else will. The city will. The city will get some tax money. So, there, so that's true. But with a solar plant, we're going to put it among many cities and we're going to put it among many landowners. And we're going to spread that cash because that's the nature of the way these programs work. So it notice, and you notice in that drawing there, it's spread across many counties, all the counties. And so uh, it's, you know, it's just another way that we distribute cash. You know, we, we are energy harvesters, money distributors. Yeah. The thing I like about solar is the steady income that it provides these communities. It provides steady income for the landowner, and then it provides steady tax revenue here in Illinois that tax revenue strongly supports school districts. That's where the majority of the tax revenue goes. And as all Americans know, our schools are ailing. We, our buildings are old. They need upgrades. We need new buildings. We need new HVAC systems. We need more energy efficiency upgrades. And so that our children can have well-lit, healthy, well-ventilated in the age of COVID uh, buildings, right? Right. So it's a it's so a huge win-win. Shall we talk about uh, the largest EPCs and then wrap, give it a wrap? <clears throat> I I like lists because it's just cool <laughs> to see some numbers. And so I'll be honest, that's why I put this on here. I was like, ooh, here's the names, and here's some volumes and. And some stuff. And so I don't know, it was just kind of neat to see those companies on there. Uh, it's, uh, you know, Swinnerton is a neat company. You know, First Solar, they're not a developer anymore. So they're not, they got out of that business. So they won't be on that list anymore. Uh, Sterling Wilson, they're, they're an Indian group who's spreading globally and they're only doing like giant power plants. Um, I don't know, it's just a neat list to see these names Bell Electric, Mahindra, I don't even know who they are, another Indian group. That's cool. Uh, and Park, Enter Park, Jewy. Jewy's cool. They build solar plus wind plus storage plants, which I think is really cool, uh, tying those together. And if you go down to number 16, Tim, who's number 16 on that list? Scott Tech Solar, baby. There we go. I knew they were in the U.S. I knew that. There you go. Oh, huh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, just big I, I, I'm skeptical. I, I don't believe that. I, I believe that this this may be taking some stats from other parts of the world, but uh, they're they're saying the, these are the stats just for developments in the U.S. Yes, yeah, specifically, this is the U.S. list. Uh, this list was based off a global list, also, okay. um, and this just chunked out the U.S. portion. So there's somewhere if you follow this article, there might be a link on PV Magazine somewhere. 
that uh, talks about the globalist. And, uh, and I think there's, this is just like a two part article, like the international site talked about the globalist and then the U S site talked about the U S list. And, uh, yeah. and so this is, this is who's there. Yeah. There's, there's some names I recognize Baywa Reed. They have a project here in Champaign County, McCarthy. I think they're out of Missouri. Um, Canadian solar course, still doing that vertical integration. They're a panel manufacturer that is also a solar developer. I once interviewed with Cypress Creek. They flew me out to Cali. They didn't, uh, they declined my services. The guy who interviewed me, uh, said I was old for using pen and paper and I was laughed because I'm like, damn it. I was trying to look responsible by using pen and paper. And he said I was old. <laughs> the youth, the youth. That is too funny. Well, it's their loss, man. I agree. I agree. You know, before we leave though, I want to do one quick thing. Uh, and I want to, I want to influence you and, and uh, see if I can turn it into a, a weekly thing that we do. And it's a spot solar pricing. And I just wanted to go over what, you know, things cost every week. There's an update from three different websites and I keep track of them. And, uh, you know, if you have an interest, I would love to talk to people about what solar panels cost, solar cells, some wafers, and just kind of put it in everybody's head. So we get a, you know, a better idea of where things, uh, what things pay for around the world that make up our solar panels. Okay. Oh, you're referring to the uh, solar spot pricing story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So bring that one up and then scroll down to the third one when you get it up. And check out PV info link. So scroll, I got to keep going? One. Yep, yep, do the third one. There you go. Click that image. Perfect. So PV info link. They keep up with pricing. They publish this every Wednesday. And uh, so, you know, I, I always check it out. And these are costs in Asia for various types of hardware. Uh, it starts with the polysilicon all the way at the top of the thing. And you can see the price of polysilicon. This is the feedstock that goes into making types of solar cells. You see the price per kilogram, uh, $7 up to 11 it up Recently, it was a little stronger because of a shortage. And uh, that's the base product. So if you wanted to buy a kilogram of, uh, of that, it's... There's your cost. Uh, you'd have to do a lot of work to make it into something. And that's what you kind of see. The next chunk is the wafer. So this is a, a raw chunk of silicon cut into a thin wafer. And it's, it's not specialized yet. It's just silicon. So you can get your silicon cut in certain ways. And then you buy that and you turn it into a cell. And the cell is where you process that silicon and you make it into your cell whether it's going to be a hetero junction, whether it's going to be a, a perk, whether it's going to be this or that. And you'll buy the type of wafer you want, whether you want it to be a multi-silicon, which is a cheaper cell, slightly less efficient, or a monosilicon, which is cooked more, more efficient, more pure. And you start processing these. And you know, on this list, you can see uh, that wafers, they cost on a per unit price of you know 20 cents. Um, uh, 40 cents. And if you roughly a wafer is five to six Watts. So you now have a rough number, uh, us dollars. If you get a 20 cent wafer and it's five Watts, that's four cents a Watt for a wafer, but you don't call it in wattage cause it's not processed yet. You don't know what the wattage of this wafer is. So they sell wafers at the cell level. You notice they have a price per unit per Watt. So when you get a cell, it's 10 cents a Watt, 15 cents a Watt. And so that's like a big base chunk that's going into your solar panel, anywhere from seven to 15 cents a watt in the nicest panels. The next level, you got mono, you got your modules and modules can cost anywhere from 16 to 35 cents, depending what type of product you're buying. Uh, the United States tends to buy higher end product because that's what our consumers like. And, uh, and they even talk about glass all the way at the bottom, which I thought was neat because I'd never seen glass you know, that's the cost, uh, you know, 41 uh, renminbi and a renminbi is about, um, you know, seven renminbi for a dollar. So that's like six bucks per square meter. And maybe that's, uh, you know, five to 10 bucks for the glass that goes into a solar panel, big chunk of the cost, it's probably a little bit less, but somewhere around there. 
And so it's just, it's neat to see the pricing as it moves every single week up and down the spot pricing and mostly down, you know, recently we had a shortage of silicon because there were some factory fires. And so pricing moved up through the whole chain, but now it's settling back down again. And uh, I just like checking it out every week. So I'll nudge you. I might be pushing it on you to check it out every week, Tim. You might have to approve and, it. I mean, most installers and developers are going to be interested in the module price, which is 27 to 35. So it's been it's been pretty steady there, I, I think, hasn't it, in the last year? Yeah. yeah, it has. It has mostly. It has gone down. It's probably it's gone down some a nickel, maybe not not maybe not a dime, but at least a nickel. Um, and uh, so it has gone down in price a bit, but it's steadyish for a while, you know, since at least the summer, because we did have some upward pricing pressure. So. So there you go, though. But weekly pricing, I, I check it out every week. It's real important just to be in the know. You know, this is like two weeks before it hits the stores that you'll see the pricing. If pricing goes up here uh, on Monday in a month, you'll see it in your shop having to deal with it. So so it's good to know things a month early. Yeah. Well, before we go, uh, I do want to make a couple of announcements. I want to encourage everybody to check out Tony Siba's book, <clears throat> Clean Disruption. And Tony is a well-known speaker and he's a professor at Stanford University. If you're interested in the clean energy transition, check out Clean Disruption by Tony Siba. The subtitle is Disruption of Energy and Transportation. He famously gives that story of uh, you know, photos of New York City in 1901 and then 1913. In 1901, it's all horse and buggy, one ice engine vehicle. Fast forward to 1913, and it's all ice engines, one horse and buggy in the photo. It's amazing. That is what we are on the cusp of here, John, with electric vehicles, right? The ice engine is going to go bye bye in the next five to 10 years. I don't think it's going to be 10 years even, but, but anyway, this transition that Tesla has catalyzed, their timing was impeccable. They were on the bleeding edge and now they're a force to reckon with, right? And you see them doubling down and expanding with building these. Now we're just referring to them as Terra factories. So I don't know. Are, are you uh, are you a fan of Tony Siba? Yeah, Tony's cool, but I think Tony Siba mostly repackaged Ray Kurzweil, his doubling. Uh, I wrote a really great article on T Siba a while back, one of his videos that was very positively received. And I covered that sp slide presentation where he initially shared that image you referenced there. And uh, I was very happy to see uh, Ray Kurzweil's ideas being talked about. And so I think if anybody wants to read Ray, uh, Siba, you should start with something even before Siba and do some Ray Kurzweil and his doubling, his accelerated, his, his singularity that is approaching because these two authors, these two technologists are in the same vein. So Siba and Kurzweil, with Kurzweil being the predecessor and Siba seeing it applied to our modern technology, specifically energy storage, automotive driving, uh, LIDAR, solar batteries, things of that nature. I like Siba. I like him uh, pushing the Kurzweil language. Very important for us to keep seeing it. Yeah, I think Kurzweil uh, emphasizes more the AI. Uh, when you mentioned the singularity, right? That is a specific reference to, today we have narrow AI, which would be like a self-driving vehicle. And the prediction is that we will develop an AGI, an artificial general intelligence that will be smarter than humans and then what happens is the machine invents machines that are thousands of times smarter than humans in a very rapid iteration right it goes vertical and hence the ai explosion which is potentially catastrophic for us not because the ai or the agi wants to snuff us out but because it wants to achieve its goal which we don't know what its goal could be. Once it becomes an AGI, it's going to think for itself and basically want to go interstellar. And so it might do something silly like coat the earth with photovoltaic panels, and then we don't have any food to eat. 
Um, but uh, so yeah, Kurzweil is making that prediction. It's it's coming in the next 20 years, the AGI. I I I don't know that I want to be here when the AGI happens. <laughs> I think uh, I think we'll be part of it. I think, or maybe I don't know. Who knows? Who the heck knows? Maybe maybe the AGI will need us. But maybe but there's gonna be plenty of people that fight to be the AGI. I think the AGI might start with some Wall Street or military people who uh, just install some gear inside of themselves to compete better on, in our global market. And those people will be the first, uh, the smartest machine creatures on the planet. And it'll keep going from there. I yep. think that's, I think the blend of us is going to be more powerful than just the thing we make, but who knows? I mean, that's, that's kind of arrogant to think that this flesh of ours could hypothetically be the end all be all. Uh, you know, it's probably that we end up in the dustbin of history along with dinosaurs, highly probable, but who knows? We stick a chip inside of us. Maybe that gives us another few million years of existence and we can break free of uh, our chains. Yeah, Musk is definitely beating that drum. If you can't beat him, join him. And so his path to joining is Neuralink. We'll see if that works. Well, I want to make a few announcements. We've uh, we've been going here for a little over an hour. Please, if you appreciate the content that John and I are bringing you here on the Clean Power Hour, please give us a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. Go to cesnrg.com forward slash videos. That's where you can find all of this content. Here it's mostly the, on the, on the upper part of the page, you have the solar podcast where I interview thought leaders like Dan Leary of Dino Watts Solar out of Boston. They're disrupting the weather station for solar PV. Uh, we have an interview here with Chris Connell at Fronius talking about rapid shutdown and solar safety. Austin Williams, thank you, John, for the intro to Austin Williams. I love the PV booster. And I love how it pencils for uh, rooftop with solar uh, single axis trackers for rooftop. Shout out to our buddy, Eric Posse in Minnesota. His book is now available, The Clean Wave, A Guide to Success in the Green Economy. Just go to Amazon and search on Clean Wave Book Posse, P-A-S-I. He gave me an advanced copy. It's a wonderful uh, tour of energy efficiency and green technologies. So many ways for people to get involved in the industry. And no matter your interest, literally, no matter your interest, you, you could be a bean counter and get into the clean energy industry, right? Uh, Jigger Shah, uh, he falls in the category of what I call thought leaders uh, together with Jan Brandt there. Um, so please give us a thumbs up, check us out and share and comment. We wanna hear from you. We get surprisingly few comments so far, John, and it, and so what we do is what we think is important and relevant, but we'd love to hear from our viewers and listeners. John, how can people reach you, the commercial solar guy? Oh, that right there, that thing you just said, that last thing, what was that that you said? <laughs> commercial solar guy. There you go. That's it. Type that into Google. You'll find me all over uh, our website, commercialsolarguy.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, Twitter. And uh, just trying, trying to get out there, but uh, commercialsolarguy.com and you can see some projects and send us a message if you need any uh, consulting, support, et cetera. Awesome. Well, thank you, John. And everybody have a great day. We really appreciate you listening. Let's grow solar and storage. Be well, Tim.